Hi, my name is Steve Triestman. I'm at the Institute of Neurobiology at the University of Puerto Rico in San Juan. I decided to try something different, and so instead of going to a research university, I went to a small college and took a faculty position at Bryn Mawr College. So I stayed for four years, but then I did a 180 degree turn and uh, went to a research institute. So I went to the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology in Worcester, Massachusetts, stayed there for 11 years and was pretty successful at my research there. Decided I wanted to get back into a more academic environment, so moved one mile away to the University of Massachusetts Medical School, which is in Worcester, and um, had a great stay there from 92 until probably 2006, I think. Um, there, I carried on my research moving primarily into the actions of alcohol on the nervous system and mechanisms of alcoholism at the level of individual uh, molecules. And in particular, ended up focusing on the development of tolerance. And can we measure tolerance in an individual molecule? And what does that look like? Uh, I loved working on addiction because it's, to me, addressing the key question that people want to know, which is, why do I do things that I don't want to do? Um, I mean, that really seems to me the, the cornerstone of, of human behavior. Endless attempt to not eat too much, to not drink too much, to not, to not do something that people then do. So why is it when there's such a great deal of resolve to behave in a certain way, do we almost universally get sidetracked into behaving in a different way. And to me, that's what addiction encapsulates. Very few addicts at some point in their lives want to continue taking drugs. Yet, of course, they can't stop. So um, I felt that if we could understand that, we would understand a basic component of human behavior. And so that includes craving, which, of course, is, a, again, a universal component of doing the things we may not wish we were doing. And I felt it was something we could attack on the level of molecules. So when I started working with alcohol, it was considered a terrible field to work in. Alcohol was considered a very dirty drug. It didn't have a specific molecular receptor like opiates did. So it was a, um, a promiscuous drug, essentially. Could it could attack lots of different things. So I started out with the task of saying, you know, maybe it's not so promiscuous. And I decided to look at um, ion channels and membranes, uh, which I was familiar with. And it turned out it wasn't promiscuous. It turned out there was a very small subset of channels that responded to alcohol at levels that were clinically meaningful. So immediately this idea of a promiscuous drug that you couldn't study really disappeared. And then... Um, we had the question of which channel protein to study. We studied what was, is called the BK channel, which is a calcium activated potassium channel. And it turned out to be an unbelievably lucky choice of channel, just unbelievably lucky. So we first described the molecular interactions of the drug, in this case alcohol, <clears throat> with the channel, discovering that, again, it wasn't promiscuous in its actions, even at the level of one protein so that it didn't affect the voltage dependency of the channel, it didn't affect the ion selectivity, it only affected the gating of the channel, which is the propensity to open or close. There it had a tremendous effect. And so we felt that, well, maybe this is something we can really get much greater insight into. And we did. We figured out all kinds of things about that, which set the stage for then looking at tolerance, which to me, again, is a incredibly important um, component of human behavior because it mimics learning and memory. <clears throat> and of course that's what shapes our behavior. So the reason I was saying how important BK is is because if we can understand now I realized BK we can really understand not just a model system but a true component in tolerance. And um, 
two ways that BK channel is modified is number one, what's called splicing, in which the, the RNA that actually translates the proteins can be modified slightly, giving you a different channel protein with different physiological characteristics. And two is that there are auxiliary subunits. So without going into lots of details, the channel is primarily an alpha subunit, which makes it poor for ions to pass through. But then there are beta subunits that come together with the alpha subunit to modify it. So we published two papers that I think was, were quite critical for understanding um, tolerance and that kind of plasticity. One was that when the beta-4 subunit was coupled to the alpha subunit, you didn't see tolerance in the channel. So no matter how long it saw alcohol, it would keep, to be, keep being excited by the alcohol. If you took away the beta subunit, you saw very fast tolerance. So within a few minutes, it was activated just as before, but that activation disappeared. So that was tolerance at the molecular level. And then we carried that through to every level, and we discovered that um, at the level of the action potential, it didn't show tolerance if the beta subunit was there. In brain slices, synaptic activity and action potentials did not show tolerance. And finally, the animal at the behavioral level didn't show tolerance. So the hyperactivity, for example, that the drug induces, if, the, if we took a knockout, I should have said this, so we used knockout mice. So one class of mice were normal wild-type mice they didn't show tolerance. Their hyperactivity lasted until the alcohol was gone from their system. But if we knocked out the beta subunit, they would be hyperactive and then immediately come back down to baseline levels. Um, but the real kicker was that if we then looked at alcohol drinking behavior, the knockout mouse drank much more than the wild type mouse. The reason that that's important is because one of the best predictors for development of alcoholism in people was their ability to show behavioral tolerance. So here we both showed that that rule held for mice as well as people, and secondly, some molecular basis for that. And then the second line of um, exploration explored what's called splicing, this business of the RNA being manipulated. And what we discovered was that alcohol very, very quickly changed the profile of splice variants. Is that too technical or is that? Okay, change the profile of splice variants. And the question was, because it happened so quickly, the mechanism was really very hard to figure out. And we had right down the hall a guy named Craig Mello, who had just won the Nobel Prize for discovering microRNA that destroyed certain RNA transcripts. So he said, oh my God, this could be it. And so what we discovered then was one particular <clears throat> uh, microRNA, microRNA9, was tremendously upregulated when neurons saw alcohol. And more importantly, of the seven or eight splice transcripts that were present, most of them were destroyed within 15 minutes due to that upregulation of microRNA9. And what was far more interesting was we discovered that those that were destroyed were sensitive to alcohol those that remained were insensitive to alcohol. So it turned out to be a very elegant means of developing tolerance in this BK channel, a molecule important for the development of behavioral tolerance. So I don't know if that tells you what. <laughs> but both of those are mechanisms of plasticity that I think will extend beyond just drug um, tolerance. It's been um, career changing. I mean, if I hadn't had those years at Bryn Mawr here, I don't know how I would have done because it's not just a matter of being able to go down the hall and talking about the voltage clamp. It's also meeting all the leaders in the field so that you, you literally know people who it would have been impossible to meet had I simply stayed in my laboratory at Bryn Mawr.